differences and languages and all of that um, that present themselves as barriers if you don't necessarily interact with the population or the individual in a particular way, they might be turned off and they might not want to hear what it is that you're bringing to them. A lot of levels about how we convey information, how we respect other people's cultural, um, you know, just, just how people interact with each other and uh, making sure we have the materials that can really reach people where they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. Okay. The huge trigger, I would get in the car and light up a cigarette. Um, yeah, very difficult. Not to mention, if you think about someone who drives a truck as a, um, as a living, they're in their car for long periods of time and the boredom that's involved in that. So you're bringing up not only a care activity of driving and smoking, but also it's a way that people feel, it, it comes back to the, the coping. It's a way that people deal with coping, maybe the person is lonely, it's a way to deal with that. What else? What else makes it difficult to play? Yes. I think a lot of our clients are so like short-term focused. They don't think about long-term consequences and what can happen down the road of life. Like almost like a teenager kind of mentality. Yeah. The only way I can think of it is like there's no reality of all mortality. Yeah. I don't know any other way to phrase that. Well, what you're talking about is the, the lack of immediate right. consequences. Other than the financial aspect of it, there's nothing that kind of makes you feel negative immediately, unless you're already having physical symptoms. Yeah. Well, if you notice, I sort of, I listed things in sort of categories. Does anyone know why I did that? One of the things that, that makes it hard to quit is that tobacco dependence is not just a physical addiction, but it's what we call a biopsychosocial addiction. It's, there's the biological piece of it, there's the psychological piece of it, and there's the social piece of it. And you have a handout in your packet that is called the biopsychosocial model. And it addresses exactly all of these issues. So what makes it hard to quit? There's the biological piece here. That the, the substance in tobacco that is physically addictive is nicotine, right? Nicotine is comparable to heroin and cocaine in its addictive potential. Um, and it's harder than heroin or cocaine to, uh, to get off of. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how nicotine affects the brain. Um, nicotine affects the same part of the brain that other drugs of addiction and alcohol affect. It affects the pleasure and reward centers of the brain. And what happens is when someone smokes a cigarette, it produces a, a very rapid distribution of nicotine to the brain. Does anyone know how fast nicotine reaches the brain once you take a six seconds? It, six seconds, seven to ten seconds is sort of the average. But you're right on track. So it's fast, right? So seven to ten seconds, you inhale that cigarette smoke. It goes from your lungs to your bloodstream to your brain. Boom, you get an immediate kick. And what happens is that nicotine instructs your brain to do a number of things simultaneously. Um, so the nicotine in and of itself is a stimulant. It stimulates your adrenal glands. And this produces a flood of epinephrine, which is adrenaline, into your body, which is that, that plug <coughs> of sense of like, you know, alertness and energy that people get when they smoke a cigarette. But what the adrenaline is also doing is it's increasing your blood pressure, it's increasing your heart rate, it's constricting your blood vessels, and those are the risk factors for stroke and heart attack, right? Um, so, um, so you've got kind of that stimulant ball like going on. And the other thing that it does, and this has to do with the weight issue,
that not only is um, smoking cigarettes psychologically a way to manage weight because you know you can put a cigarette in your mouth instead of you know food, but also uh, um, nicotine has a biological um, function in appetite suppressant uh, as an appetite suppressant because what nicotine does is that it floods the body with, it instructs the pancreas to flood the body with glucose and suppress insulin output. And insulin is what controls the blood sugar. So the smoker is in a state of constant hyperglycemia, which means that you're sort of constantly in high blood sugar. Low blood sugar is when your blood sugar drops when you get hungry, and you need to eat. So if you're in a, a state of, of elevated blood sugar, your appetite is going to be lower. So there's a biological function to the appetite suppressant aspect of it. In addition, nicotine is a stimulant, so it's raising your metabolism. And so you're burning calories at a higher rate. So there's a real, you know, there is a, a biological function to the weight management issue, as well as the psychological aspect to it. And then finally, the other physical aspect of nicotine has to do with um, the, the release of dopamine, which is the feel-good brain chemical that other drugs of addiction also release. And dopamine has the effect of relaxing people, of making people feel good. Um, and so what nicotine does to the brain is it tells the brain to flood it with dopamine, and so people get this overwhelming sense of, of feeling good. But the problem is that, like any drug of addiction, you begin to build up a tolerance to that. And so pretty soon, you just need the nicotine in order to get normal amounts of uh, dopamine released in your brain. So a lot of times, the calming effect that people experience from smoking has less to do with the effect of smoking and more to do with psychological aspects of it and also um, the reduction of withdrawal symptoms. Chances are someone is experiencing some withdrawal symptoms um, without maybe realizing it. They have a cigarette, they feel better because they've um, gotten their dose of their drug. Their withdrawal symptoms are um, eliminated and they feel better, but they associate that with feeling more relaxed, feeling better, you know, smoking relaxes me. Um, so the reason that nicotine is so addictive is that, you know, you get that immediate kick of, you know, the alertness, feeling good, the withdrawal symptoms subside, but it dissipates in a matter of moments. Um, so you have to keep introducing, reintroducing the drug into your system in order to get that same kick. Um, so that's the biological function of it. And then the psychological piece of it, people mentioned, look at this huge list. Psychologically, people become very dependent on tobacco use. It's used as a stress management tool, a huge way of dealing with stress. And just a, a, as a coping mechanism in general, you know, it's uh, years of smoking really teach a person to light up in response to anything, right? It becomes the go-to drug. You know, you're bored, you're lonely, you're scared, you have a cigarette. Uh, you're happy, you have a cigarette. It's, it's really the drug for all occasions. Um, you're hungry, you have a cigarette. And, you know, someone mentioned about control, that it's, it, you know, it's one of the few areas that, some, that people sometimes feel like they have control over. And that's, that's very true, especially for someone who's also living with a, a mental health uh, disorder or a, a substance use disorder. Um, their cigarettes may be the one thing that have been there with them through the highs and lows and the ups and downs and uh, that they've had control. Um, and the lack of importance is the other issue. You know, if someone is in the early stages of change, which Jan's going to talk about after lunch, um, you know, they're going to have all sorts of rationalizations and, you know, about why, not, why quitting is not important to them. Um, and if it's not important, 
important, um, they're not going to be motivated to quit, right? You have to want to quit in order to quit. But importance isn't, isn't the only thing that you need to have. There also has to be a sense of confidence. And people may lack confidence in quitting um, because, you know, stress is a huge reason that people don't have the confidence to quit because they feel like, I wouldn't be able to manage stress without smoking. Or maybe they've tried to quit before and the withdrawal symptoms have been overwhelming. Um, whatever the issue is that makes them feel that they don't have the skills or the resources to quit, it, it will affect their confidence. Um, so, and, and all of that is also going to affect their motivation. So a lack of confidence, a lack of importance, and a lack of motivation will also um, make someone less likely to, to want to quit and um, make them more psychologically dependent. Yes? Uh, I just have a question. So with that being said, how do you address the pharmacotherapy piece of it and, and be able to help them, them quit? Well, we're going to talk about treatment uh, this afternoon, but just briefly what I would say is that um, you can combine uh, nicotine replacement therapy with other medications. So if someone's already on antidepressants, if someone's on antipsychotic medications, they can still use the nicotine uh, replacement therapies available as an adjunct to but the that. pharmacotherapy, like the brenoclean and the they can't use the brenoclean with the antidepressant, was what my understanding was. Well, but not they if they're on another antidepressant. Right, right. but right. they can use the bupropion, correct, or no? They can, no. The, the um, Chantex is also known as bupropion. No, no, sorry, Chantex yeah. is brenoclean. They, they, that is a, a prescription medication that their uh, doctors would need to evaluate them for in terms of appropriateness. Um, the bupropion, also known as Wellbutrin, also known as Zyban, is was originally marketed as a, an antidepressant. Yeah. And then it was discovered that people who were on this uh, were starting to quit smoking. Um, so in lower doses, it's used as an anti, uh, or as a uh, quit smoking um, and marketed as Zyban. So if someone's already on an antidepressant, um, it wouldn't make sense for them to be on Zyban. But there are other there are other options available in terms of quick smoking. Yeah, but I think it's important aid. to note that the research shows that if you pair those two together, they're more likely to quit and stay quit. So when they see that, as far as their self-efficacy, when, when, it, when it comes to motivational interviewing, when they're in a group setting and all of that, when they see that, I think it's important for them to understand that usually the cocktail drugs that they're already on, they can't go on any other form of therapy. No, the, uh, the research is about, um, not just about Zyban or Chantix um, and NRT. It's about using some form of either Zyban, Chantix, NRT, in addition to counseling. So if someone's already on medication, they can use NRT in addition to counseling, and that's still within the uh, best practices recommendations for tobacco treatment. Um, and within that, you can do combination of, if someone has a very high level of nicotine addiction, you can do a nicotine patch and an adjunct of nicotine gum. You can combine those two. And people don't know that. I'm going to be very clear in saying that. People do not know that. People and they're not afraid. Like and they're afraid. They're afraid to smoke with the patch on, too. Yeah. Which is okay. Yeah. I tell them it's okay. I'm not a nurse, but I tell them it's okay and to talk to the doctor about right. it. Right. And the, the, um, the <coughs> FDA is going to be coming out with updated um, um, standards for treatment around NRT because there has been a lot of um, misinformation. The, the recommendations that came out originally have, you know, have, uh, are outdated at this point based on the research that's, you know, happened between now and then. 
Um, so yeah, it is. It, it can be challenging um, working within the system when not everyone has access to that information, and they're basically just going by the package insert on the NRT. It's coming out today. Oh, it's it. Yeah, there oh, you go. Yeah. Hot off the press. You know. <laughs> so what's coming out is information about um, combination therapy, which can really make a difference using the patch and the gum together, using well and the patch together. Yeah, so just because someone is on psychiatric medications doesn't mean that they can't benefit from, you know, a combination of NRT in addition to counseling and still get the recommended best practices treatment approach. Does that make sense? Does that make yeah, sense? I just wanted to make sure too that I, I don't know if later on you're going to touch base on the contraindications if somebody's already on uh, a psychoactive drug that you would need to know you know, if they ask you, you know, well, is, can, will this interfere with, <coughs> with the pharmacotherapy options as far as the brentine and the anxiety? We're not going to go into a lot of detail about that today because this is really an overview training. Uh, but you do have a handout in your package about um, the different options. And, um, you know, and we can certainly give you resources for more information. Um, 